So welcome to this session uh, called Contemporary Best Clinical Practice for TAVI. Um, my name is uh, Lars Sandergaard. Uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist based in Copenhagen, and I'm here with some good friends and colleagues, and maybe we can ask um, everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe you, Alfonso, could start. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alfonso Gelasi, and I'm an interventional cardiologist based in Milan, Italy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sengo Tuvelu from Chennai, India, uh, interventional cardiologist. Hello, I'm Dave Smith. I'm a cardiologist from Swansea in the UK. I am, I'm Dr. Manik Chopra. I'm a cardiologist from Ahmedabad, India. Hi, 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 friends. Good afternoon. I'm Abhishek Rajpopat from Ahmedabad, India. Thank you. So we have some learning objectives here today talking about best contemporary practice for TAVI. First of all, we're going to discuss how a good pre-procedural workup can help you to optimize your procedural planning. We're also going to discuss how a certain valve can be better for patients with certain kind of phenotypes. And then we're going to talk about how to optimize the procedure in order to have the best long-term outcome for the patient. We want the session to be as interactive as possible, so please use your PCR React on, on your app. Uh, Dave here can, can, uh, can see your questions. Or if you have any questions, you're also welcome just to step to the microphone to try to interact as much as possible. You're going to see that we're going to spend most of the time to discuss this patient. We're not going to, to give lectures. So it's going to be a very interactive discussion, like it would be in a heart team, having the patient in front of them and try to plan the best procedure for the patient. So the patient we're going to discuss is a relatively young patient, at least according to the European uh, standard, 60-year-old female. She got uh, a normal body size, I would say. We notice that her body surface area is 1.75 square meter. She got a history of arterial hypertension, hypercholesteremia. She got diabetes type 2, atrial fibrillation, and she was presenting with increasing uh, shortness of breath. She is now in function class 3 and also have one episode of syncope during exercise. And the referring side diagnosed her to have severe aortic stenosis, and that's why she was referred. And that was confirmed on echocardiography. You can see she have a tight aortic stenosis. Opening area is only 0.5 square centimeter with high gradient, peak 99, and mean 65 millimeter mercury. <clears throat> LV got impaired function. Ejection fraction is 35%, and it's also hypertrophic. She got atrial fibrillation, and actually she also had in the past a VVI pacemaker. She had a coronary angiography. There was no significant stenosis, but remember, she had uh, diabetes, she had uh, hypertension, also hypercholesterolemia. So that needs to be taken into account that these coronary should be able to access later on. Her lab findings was unremarkable. And of course, she had a CT scan, and you can see, looking here at the pyramid-derived diameter, is 21.5 millimeter. So that's a relatively small aortic annulus. We often say if it's 23 or less, it's a small aortic annulus. Of course, you have to relate it to the patient's size. This patient was not a small lady. Her body surface area was 1.75 square meter. LVUT had approximately the same size. There was no calcification in the annulus. And also sinus vasalva was relatively to white, 25, 26, and 27 millimeter. ST junction, 21 millimeter, here yeah, times 21 with some calcification. And also here, if you can see that it's a tricuspid aortic valve, and it got, I would say, at least moderate to severe calcification of all three leaflets, quite symmetrical distributed. Coronary height take up was okay, right 13.5 and left 14.8 <coughs> millimeter above the aortic annulus. The aortic was not particularly vertical, it was a little bit horizontal. You see the angulation here is 62 degrees. We often say 7 degrees is, is a tres, uh, the threshold for what we, when we call it horizontal. So even though it's not horizontal, it's on the way to it. We identify on the CT scan two important views. There's the three cusp co planar view, which in this case, as you can see here, is LAO 16, cortical 5 degrees. 
and also what most sites nowadays will use for valve implantation, the right left cuspo lab view, which is in this case a doable angulation, REO only two degrees, and caudal 34 degrees. Of course, we look at uh, the access vessel first starting here with the orchic guards. It's no acute angulation. We see there's normal takeoff of the three orchic, uh, the three uh, neck vessels. And also the access vessel was okay. A little bit of calcium, not too tortuous, but otherwise good size. So that should not be an issue for, for a vascular access here as a transfemoral access. So maybe we can start here. Um, what do you think of this patient? Uh, if you start with you, Alphonse, I can go to the, to the white screen when we say, so it is, it's a young patient, um, as I said, she's only 68 years of age. Well, I, looking at the patient characteristics, we should consider in order to direct our decision in terms of surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve replace, replacement to the age, I would say to the comorbidities and to the anatomical features at the level of the axis and of the valve. So the patient is relatively young, as you said, at least for European standards, so the first idea, the first thought would be to send, send her to the, to the surgeon. But we have another very important feature for this lady, and this is the annulus. As you say, the annulus it is relatively small. So small annuli are relatively frequent in South Europe and in Asia, probably less in Mid and North Europe. But this kind of feature it is really very important when we are going to send the patient to the surgeon because it is well known that implanting small surgical bioprosthesis could be associated with high residual gradient after mm -hmm. implantation and potentially with patient prosthesis mismatch, which was very well discussed with, I mean, by surgeons, mm -hmm. a bit less by us interventional cardiologists. So not easy, the decision, but uh, discussion is open, taking into account all these uh, features we wrote on the on the, on the screen. Yeah, so I think that's also what I noticed is young patient, small aortic annulus, you know, at the same time quite large body surface area, and also she have risk factor for coronary artery disease, so we have to keep that in mind. But let's start with the, with the small annulus and you say patient prestige mismatch. I actually got a slide here, what is the definition of patient prestige mismatch? So you can see this is actually what you gain after valve implantation, whether it's a surgical or transcatheter valve you put into the patient, you're going to measure the effective uh, orifice area of that valve, and you're going to divide it with the patient's body surface area. And you can see these are the criteria. If you get below 0.65 square centimeter square meter, we're talking about severe patient prestige mismatch. It's between 0.65 and 0.85, it's moderate and it's more than 0.85 is insignificant. So Senko, it, this has been very controversial in the past, at, at least from the surgeon saying, does this actually matter whether you have patient prestige match match? So we have been seeing the, in the studies that you know you have patient, particularly severe patient process mismatch. It leads to early valve degeneration and uh, uh, sh shorter valve of, 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 uh, duration. So that is one of the big concerns of the mm. valve durability. So uh, and for a patient like this, uh, in, a, in a young patient. Uh, you have to have, if you look at the Garland's formula, if you have effective orifice area of about two, then the, uh, as cardiac output increases, then the gradient will not increase. But but if in a patient, an elderly elderly patient, the age where even exercise will increase the gradient, and uh, this will lead to more symptoms, and particularly in a patient who, who can who have to do some hard exercises. Yeah. So you're going to have an increased like, residual gradient afterwards. You're going to have less remodeling of the left ventricle. Uh, regression of the hypertrophy. And as you said, despite it was discussed for a long time whether it actually would affect the outcome for the patient. You can see here that the risk of early valve failure is increased if you have it. It's almost twice as high that if you can avoid to have patient prestige match match. And also if you look at the patient's survival, the risk of cardiac mortality is about one third increased if you have moderate and if you have severe patient prestige mismatch, it's a six-fold increase 
in cardiac mortality. So again, it will affect the patient's outcome. It will also affect the patient's symptoms, quality of life, and so on. So it is very important to avoid patient perceived mismatch. And as I said uh, before, Dave, in the past, surgeons was a little bit skeptic about whether this actually have an impact. I think everyone nowadays appreciate it's something we should avoid. And let's say this patient is 60 year, 68 years of age. She could, of course, go for surgery. What, what, should this, what would you advise your surgeons to do if, if, if he or she took her to the OR? Of course, what I advise them to do and what they will do might be two different things. Clearly, in a small annulus, we would like a root enlargement. Sadly, in my centre, and I suspect in many centres, the rate of root enlargement is virtually never. So, clearly... And, and why is that? Why, why, I mean, surgeons know that these patients are at risk when you put it, particularly a surgical valve in, because you have your suture ring. Yeah. So why don't they do the root enlargement? A very good question. I mean, clearly it, it adds a risk to the procedure. We clearly in our heart team meetings will have a discussion about, yes, we'll enlarge the root, but when we find out what operation was actually performed, it does not include uh, root replacement. And I think that's common across many, uh, many centers in many countries. Um, and I suspect the reason for that is the perceived risk and that they know that for patients undergoing TAVI, we have a low risk procedure in these days and therefore in a surgical aortic valve replacement plus root enlargement, perhaps there's a fear of increasing the risk of the procedure, certainly compared against a low risk TAVI procedure. Yeah, so I think that's also, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, if there's any surgeons in the room, please feel free and come and, and give a comment on this. But again, it's all about to try to put a patch from the uh, sinus of a salva across the annulus into the LVT thereby to be able to get a bigger valve in and thereby a large opening area and a smaller risk of patient procedure mismatch. And there's been concern that it's going to increase the risk of the procedure, it's going to prolong the time of the procedure. But if you talk with surgeons who are doing this as a routine, they say it's very little at added risk, very little added time to the procedure. But as I hear I said, it's less than 1% of the patient undergoing surgical aortic valve replacement who have root enlargement. I heard yesterday that in the US, in the STS uh, database, it's 2.5%. So it's certainly something surgeons are not using. Manik, one, if you want the surgeons to do root enlargement, a surgeon needs to know before he or she go into the OR that this is a patient at risk for patient procedure mismatch. This patient had a CT scan as a routine, and in our institution, we are doing CT scan in all patients referred for aortic valve replacement whether it's surgical or transcatheter. How is it in, 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 in your institution? Is it something you do or will the surgeon be fully, uh, will not be aware about, uh, about this before the chest is open? Yeah, so before, uh, before I went back home, uh, the practice was probably the analyst was decided on echo and most of the times we all find that the surgical valves were undersized, but off late we have started doing CT scan for most of the patients who come for uh, aortic valve replacement so that we can find this subgroup of small annuli. Uh, so also, even if they are surgically treated, the surgeon knows that probably this is the valve size and whether he's ready to do something more than a standard valve replacement for it. And he also probably understands that the transcatheter heart valve, maybe supranal is going to give you a better effective orifice area. So that way, selection of TAVI and selection of uh, supranal valve uh, goes more in favor of such patients, uh, especially in such subset of patients. So let's say you have a patient, you, you, you know that up front that the patient is at risk, will, and will you discuss it with the surgeon where the surgeon is willing to do root enlargement, and if not, will you look for another surgeon or another treatment option? So uh, as such, there are very few surgeons who are really doing root enlargements, and most of them would probably uh, shrug their shoulders, and uh, I think it would finally land up with us. Mm. Unless and until the patient is very young, and in those patients, then probably uh, we have to balance the risk of uh, coronaries as well as the risk of hemodynamic uh, superiority of uh, transcatheter heart valve. But if it goes, then probably it is uh, TAVA, and then maybe supranal because it is going to give you a better effective orifice area. So you say that if a certain... <laughs> 
Don't want to do it. One option could be look for a TAVI procedure. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, let's say that this patient will not go for surgery because you're concerned that the surgeon will not do the root enlargement. The patient will end up with a too small prosthesis, which is going to probably is going to follow the patient for the rest of her life because it's not going to be explanted. You make the decision, this patient will go for TAVI. Does it matter which kind of TAVI platform you're going to use? Uh, yeah, it, it certainly matters because once you are using an intraannular valve, the orifice areas are much lesser. And so is the chances of patient processes mismatch is, uh, is substantially high. And as you just discussed just now, that it affects not only the quality of life, durability of the prosthesis, as well as the mortality in the future. So anywhere we have a smaller annulus, our inclination is quite high towards using a self-expanding superannular platform in such patients. So, so again, I mean, uh, I don't know, is, is this something everyone is aware of, uh, Alfonso, that the difference between these platforms, this is just one uh, study showing that uh, in patients, particularly at risk patients with smaller autoganali, as I said before, 23 millimeter or less, using balloon expandable valve or self-expanding valve is going to give you a different rate of PPM. Is, is that common knowledge? Well, actually, we have data telling us that using a balloon expandable device versus a uh, self-expanding with supraannular leaflet position, it is associated with higher residual gradients and lower effective orifice area. I mean, we have data from randomized control trials, particularly I'm referring to the CHOICE trial, but also there are some propensity matched analysis comparing new generation devices and the results are always comparable. So actually this is something well known and we have to take care about this data when we are going to decide which THV to implant in our patient with a small annulus because it makes make the difference particularly in a 68 years old lady with a long life expectancy. So to me, it is something really very important and it makes sense to choose a self-expanding device with supraannular leaflet position in such a patient in case the surgeon refuses the patient because he's not able to perform a aortic root enlargement. So it is something very reasonable. Yeah. And I think also, I mean, everyone who's been using both type of platform knows that if you use a self-expanding technology, will you will have a higher effective orifice area afterwards and often have a one-digit mean gradient. If you're doing a balloon expandable valve, it's often a two-digit gradient, lower opening area. And I also think, even though we haven't seen long-term data on, uh, on durability, I mean, the data we've seen out to five years at least indicate that if you use a self-expanding technology, you're going to have a better durability, less structure valve restoration, less valve failure than if you use a balloon expandable valve. There is one important study which has already com been completed, the SMART trial, uh, where patients was randomized between Evolute from Medtronic, self-expanding valve with a super leaflet position, or a balloon expandable valve, Sapien 3 for, for, um, from Edwards. And that was, as I said before, patient with smaller autoganali, and that's going to give us, how should I say, for the first time, randomized data about how is the outcome for patients with smaller autoganali treated with balloon versus self-expanding technology. Not only short-term, but also long-term um, uh, durability. And I think that's going to be very crucial as we moving to patient at a younger age with longer life expectancy that we start already now to think we need a valve with a good durability. Next uh, issue, I think uh, I would say, I don't know, have you anything to add to this? I think, I think we can all agree that that's something we need to take into account here when we're going to treat the patient, that uh, we, we need to try to avoid patient position mismatch. Again, as I said before, it's a young patient. Uh, she, got, um, she got risk factors for coronary artery disease and will likely need a coronary re-intervention intervention in the, in, the, in the future. So it's important that we should be able to access the coronary arteries afterwards. And if you do not pay attention when we implant this valve, they're going to be orientated randomly in the aortic annulus. And you can end up in a situation, as you see on the left side, where you have what we call severe commissural misalignment. You can see that the leaflet posts from the transcatheter heart valves are positioned right in front of the coronary <coughs> arteries. And a few years back, we saw that re-access study from, from Italy showing that for some of these platforms, if that's the case, it will be impossible to access the coronary arteries afterwards. So just imagine this patient, 
68 years of age, you implant, implant a valve and you don't pay attention how the valve is actually orientated. And the patient will be admitted in a few years with acute coronary syndrome and you cannot access the coronary arteries. That's not going to be acceptable and that's certainly not <coughs> contemporary practice when you, when you treat this patient. So what we should all aim for is, as it's shown here on the right-hand side, commercial alignment. Single. Yeah, it's not just the coronary engagement, which is very important, but also in a young patient, it's important that the coronary misalignment can lead to increased leaflet stress. And uh, there are also reports of leaflet thrombosis and uh, degeneration. Mm. So there, there are multiple benefits of uh, having a commercial alignment, uh, particularly in a young patient. Mm. And also one should consider the, the future need for TAV and TAV. And uh, if not, we need to do a basilica or anything, definitely uh, using a commercial alignment will help uh, for future TAVI as well. So you say basilica, what does that mean? So it's a leaflet uh, splitting. Uh, it's basically to prevent uh, patients who have high risk for coronary occlusion. It's a procedure done before you implant the valve to split the leaflet so that the valve leaflets don't cause obstruct the coronaries. Yeah. So again, I can just illustrate on this uh, figure here. So I hope I could. Yeah, we'll be all here. So even if you have if you have commercial alignment, let's say that leaflet would be a risk for occluding the coronary arteries if you do a valve and valve procedure. If you split that leaflet by puncture in the middle here and slice it up, laceration, it's going to splay open. So when you implant the second valve, you can still gain access. And I think that's nowadays, at least in some institutions, common practice if you do a valve and valve procedure, if you implant a transcatheter heart valve in a failed surgical valve. But everyone is, is talking about what if patients with a treating with TAVI first time is coming back for TAV in TAV, will that also be an option? And remember, it's only going to work if you have commercial alignment of the first valve. If it's, if it's, um, if it's commercial misalignment, it doesn't help to split the leaflet here. It's not going to help you to, to gain access to the coronary arteries. So I think there's multiple reasons to try to get commercial alignment when we, we look at this coronary artery uh, access, valve and valve procedure. And it may also, as you <laughs> said, also enhance the durability of these transcatheter heart valves. And Dave, there has been a shift in how we implant these valves from, from, um, from most people will, will start out in the old days using a kind of a, a tree cusp co plan of view with the C arm in an LAO cranial projection now to what we call a, a right left cusp or whatever. You can see it's illustrated that the C arm is now moving down to an REO cordal. Just explain what, what was the rationale to, to, to make this shift? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all started off in a single view, usually LAO cranial. And in that view, we have the three cusps in a tricuspid model uh, aligned with the right in the middle, the left. Uh, to the left side and then obviously the non uh, to the right side of the aorta and what we found is that we have two curves in this uh, diagram we should be looking at both the s curve of the annulus but also the s curve of the device and they are different where they bisect to be overlapped is in the reo chordal view and so the ability to place a valve in two views means that we can get better approximation of depth on the non-coronary cusp in an REO caudal or right-left cusp overlap view and in our LEO cranial view or our coplanar view it means we get better assessment of the left cusp depth of our device. So essentially using two complementary views means that we can assess the depth of our valve implant more accurately on the non and the left side. Now clearly for the non coronary cusp below there with the intersection of the right cusp is where our left bundle lies. And we know now there's good evidence to show that if you have less deep implantation below the non coronary cusp, you're likely with most devices to reduce your pacemaker rate. Yeah. So that's uh, what is shown here. You know, on your pre-procedural CT scan, you can get this S curve. It's going to illustrate all the C arm angulations where you have the three aortic cusp aligned. And it's also illustrated here in the animation. We are often starting out to, to identify where were the three cusp one, 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 the three cusp co plan of view. But now we're moving down to this REO 
eller right left cusp overlap view. Why is that going to help the patient? It's because this is just one S curve, but you can have a second S curve. And let's see if we can get a different color here. So let's see, we get a second color, I hope so. No, it didn't work. But you can get a, a second S curve, which illustrate where you have um, no parallax in your delivery system. And as you see here, if you're up here, you may have the tree autocosp aligned with the imaging plane, but what you're often going to see on your fluoroscopy is that you have a severe parallax in your delivery system. And what people often will do, they will take the parallax out of the delivery system, meaning that it will go from one S-curve to the other S-curve. But of course, this is going to take the parallax out, but it's going to introduce the same degree of tilt in the autoganalus. So ideally, you want to implant here where these two S-curves are crossing because then you have the tree also cusp aligned with the imaging plane and no parallax in your delivery system. So you have a much better understanding where are you. Most of us cannot identify this. It's not possible in the, on your pre-procedural scanning. So that's why people are using the cusp overlap view. Even though it's not spot on, it's often very, very close to the double S-curve crossing. And also you can see here, that now the distance between the two curves are much smaller than here. So you have, a, again, a much better understanding where you are. And this is introduced to try to have a more accurate understanding where are your implant, and thereby also, even though you don't aim for high precision, you're going to end up in a high precision, and thereby reduce the risk of permanent pacemaker. So I think this is what everyone has adapted today, this COSPO lab view, in order to try to reduce the, the risk of conduction abnormality. And the double S-curve crossing is often very close to where you have your cusp overlap view. But again, coming back to what we were discussing before, we were discussing about access to the coronary arteries afterwards and how to get uh, the valve uh, uh, aligned with the, with the commissure. And you can see here on, on this picture here, if you're actually working in a... In a right left cusp overlap view, like shown here. You see the eye here is the CR. Next one. Slides, please. The eye here is the CR, the right and the left cusp are overlapping. That's the watch that's illustrating. When you do that, you know that the commissure between the right and the left cusp is pointing to the right of your floor screen. Does that make sense? In this view, you're going to have the commissure between those two cusps on the right of your floor screen. I'm going to use my finger instead of, you see the commissure is here, it's on the right of the screen. So the only thing you need to do when you're working in this view, the only thing, is to make sure that one of the posts on the transcatheter heart valve is on the right of your floor screen. The two are should be overlapping on the left-hand side when you look at your floor screen. So if you have a system where you can identify where the post located and you can talk it, when you are across the aortic arts, just at the annulus level, you're going to identify where are they lifted post. If not in position, you're going to do some talking on the system until you see one on the right-hand side and the two wire is going to overlap on the left-hand side. That's going to ensure your patient-specific commercial alignment. You all know about how to orientate the delivery system when you introduce it in the, in the, in the groin, but, but that's not going to help you for every patient because patients are different how tortuous the anatomy is, what is the angulation of the aortic arch, how is the aortic annulus orientated in the chest of the patients. But this is how I think everyone is going to move forward. All companies who are producing these heart valves are going to make these leaflet posts very easy to see on fluoroscopy and also be able to talk the system if you don't have commercial alignment so you actually get it for each individual patient. Or what, David? Is that common practice many places if, it is, if it's possible? It's not all platform, which is not all yet, yet, because it's something we started discussing just a few years back. Yeah, it, it's gaining increasing prominence, but I would say it's not standard in every uh, cath lab. But I think clearly the need to move to the mindset of treating patients for their lifetime, reducing the likelihood of conduction disease, 
improving access to coronary arteries, we need to be placing these valves accurately, not just for a single procedure, but in this lady's case, she's 68. We have to be planning for her lifetime of a potential repeat valving procedure. Manik, uh, there's also, as we discussed, uh, the, the design is different from, from valve to valve, and, and not all valve will, will um, um, sorry, um, coronary arteries is not always where you believe they are. And I think that's because we as a cardiologist never see a coronary artery. But if you ask a surgeon, the surgeon will tell you that the coronary is all, not always taking off in the middle oh, of the cusp. Uh, I, I'm just going again. I think it's easier to if I might just use my finger in, in the pointer. So here you see one cusp. And what you would expect is that the coronary artery is taking off in the middle of the cusp. But sometimes you'll have what we call coronary eccentricity that is going to take off in the side of it. And it's particularly common for the right coronary artery. It's not going to take off in the middle, but it's often going to take off here close to where you have the non-coronary cusp. So you have coronary osteal eccentricity. And if you look at patients with tricuspid aortic valve, it's about 3% of the patient who got this coronary osteal eccentricity. And if you go to bicuspid aortic valve, it's 7%. But you can see that if you have a close look at your CT scan before the procedure, you know exactly is the coronary taking off in the middle or in the right. If it's taken out here, uh, like this, eccentric, you can just adjust it so you have a coronary osteal overlap view, not a right-left cusp overlap view, but the right-left coronary overlap view, and still aim to have one of the posts on the right of the screen, on your floor screen. That's one option to, to deal with it, particularly if you handle patients with bicuspid aortic valve, where it's very common. Of course, you can also take into consideration <clears throat> what is that right coronary artery. If it's a non-dominant, maybe you should just forget about it and focus to have good alignment with the left main stem. Manik, um, what I was uh, supposed to ask you was, um, uh, we also, um, see this is just to illustrate that instead of having this right left cusp overlap view, you, you can have that right left coronary oh, overlap view. So that's going to, to ensure it. But Manik, um, not all stent frames are the same. Some will facilitate easy access to the cornea, some will have more difficult. I just showed three no. common used in, in, in Europe, the Evolute, the Navitor, and, uh, and the Aquat. Maybe you can just take us through what, what will make a difference. Uh, one thing was commercial alignment, but, but also the stents. Yeah, so uh, in general, uh, the transcatheter heart valve design, there would be two. One is the size of the cell. The larger the cell, it becomes more easier that probably we would be able to hook the coronaries even if there is mild to moderate misalignment. So that is very important because we all know, we all have tried for commercial alignment, but most of the times it is not perfect. So the size of the cells becomes very important. The larger the cells, the more easier it becomes. And second, sometimes we are also related to the it's also related to the implantation depth because if you, in, in some cases, you would probably maybe like to deploy slightly deeper so that your, you, your coronary uptake is above the level of uh, the uh, nadir of the valve. At the same time, it also helps you later on because your risk plane de goes down and your effective new LVOT, uh, effective uh, uh, new skirt is going to be lesser when you're planning a tab and tab. So these two things, I think, would place uh, more important. Uh, because actually, as you said, if you do a tab and tab uh, and use a, 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 a stem cells which they have the same height, you may not, probably not be aligned. It may be out, yeah. out of line. Thereby, you have even smaller access to, yeah. to, the, to the coronary arteries. So um, I was, we were talking uh, before about um, uh, this conduction abnormality, why this double S curve and uh, why the cost lab view was introduced. And, and I also think, Quite a few people said in the, in the past, if the patient have a new conduction abnormality, a new permanent pacemaker, that wouldn't harm the patient. But Abhishek, I think we have seen uh, recently quite robust data showing that both left bundle bands block and, and also permanent pacemaker 
impacting the outcome for the patients. Yeah, indeed. Uh, previously, we were treating very old patient and uh, they didn't have much life expectancy and so is the mobility and all. But the way we are, uh, this patient is younger and um, we are treating more and more younger patients. Uh, inducing this synchrony and giving them a pacemaker creates a lot of problem of creating a future heart failure and quality of life in such patients. Yeah. Just before the bundle branch, I want to ask something with associated with the angulations. I've noticed in my daily practice that the angulations differs between the CT derived uh, measurements and the angiography measures. Have you noticed such a thing and does it change your practice? Yeah. Yeah, and I, let let me illustrate what what you're asking because um, um, I'm just going to show you this slide. We you know it's all about implanting as high as possible without having a pop out. Your question was, the patient may be located different on on yeah. the on the table for the CT scan and and in the cat lab. So this was the the one I tried to, to draw before about the two S curve you have on the top here, the endless plane, this S curve. And this is for the delivery system. And again, as I said, if you're working up here, go start with a cosmo lab view, going down to the other curve, it's a quite a bigger distance you're traveling. If you're down here on the cosmo lab view, despite it's not exactly on the double S curve curve, it's a very little change you see. So you want to be down here. So what you do, you identify your cosmo lab view on your CT scan, patients in the CAT lab, you go with your C-arm projection in what you predicted from your CT scan, and if you see any parallax, you're going to take the parallax out because then you know you are on one of the curves. Yeah. Because potentially it could be down here, but you want to be as, as close as both. So, so even though the patient is located a little bit different on the CT scan, uh, for CT scan in the CAT lab, just make sure, go to the cosmo lab view, take the parallax out, and you know you are on one of the curves. Okay. That does that, does that explain it? Yes, that was the exact question. Okay. <laughs> So let's move on to, to what we actually should do for this patient here. And we're going to show the, uh, the case in a minute here. So what was decided here was to do a TAVI procedure. The patient actually also favored TAVI, despite we said surgery may be a better options for he, her, despite um, it could be hard to find a surgeon who was willing to do root enlargement. So going for TAVI, in this case in local anesthesia, there's no anesthetic team in the room, no sedation, the patient is fully awake. She was, because of her age, was offered to have cerebral embolic protection using the Sentinel device, right femoral access, her clothes with, with, with ProStyle, 14 French introducer sheet came in first, and then there was a pre-dilatation with an 18 millimeter balloon. 18 is matching the minor axis of the aortic annulus. So it's not too aggressive looking at the aortic annulus, just take the minor axis. That's going to be a safe pre-dilatation and often also sufficient. And then use the Hydra 26 valve. I'm going to show you here in a minute how it looks like, but it got an integrated sheet. So when you're ready to, to put this delivery system in, you remove the fortune French sheet and go in with the integrated sheet. And Alfonso, maybe I can ask you to describe this uh, relative novel platform, um, Hydra valve. Well, this is a newborn transcatheter art valve. It is available in Italy at least uh, since uh, uh, January 2022. It is, um, as you can see, a self-expanding device with supraannular leaflet position. The cell uh, frame uh, are very large, uh, around 15 French. So actually it is the, this valve has the largest um, uh, size of the frame. And it, has, it is available in three sizes, 22, 26, uh, and uh, 30 uh, millimeter. And you can use this valve in patients with perimeter ranging between 12, 53 and 85 uh, millimeter. The main characteristics, uh, at least uh, in my uh, opinion, it is the uh, flexibility, the high flexibility of the uh, delivery system, which allow the operator to better orientate the valve in uh, particularly angulated uh, our um, uh, angles. Uh, the delivery system, the new delivery system has um, 
a two steps, I would say, um, uh, release. So there is this blue uh, knob, which uh, can be rotated uh, uh, clockwise, uh, in or counterclockwise in order to um, start the deployment of the valve, while at the end you have this uh, active uh, system, which uh, allow the operator to finally release the three uh, antennae at the outflow of the valve. As uh, you said before, there is an inline sheet, 14 French compatible for valves uh, 22 and 26 millimeter, five French compatible with uh, the for the 30 millimeter Hydra. Yeah, and actually, I just want to, to just highlight what you just say, Alfonso. That black knob here, which is an active release mechanism. So you know, often you have to get these taps or tin tackles off the delivery system. For some system, it can be difficult. But here, there's actually an active one. You just rotate that black knob here counterclockwise and those hooks which are holding will just disappear and it will be released. I think that's a, something we haven't seen with any other devices. So, so I think this, well, at least was to our opinion, was a good choice for, for this patient at risk for patient prestige mismatch to make sure we could access the coronary arteries in the future. And, and, and so on, or what, what will your comment be? No, absolutely. I think uh, considering that this patient is uh, young and uh, uh, need for coronary engagement later, I think this valve has the features of uh, everything. Uh, we can uh, have the coronary engagement because of wide uh, struts, we can easily engage the coronaries as well as a supra antler valve, and we can expect a much better gradient with uh, long-term uh, benefits. Yeah. Any comments from you, guys? Uh, I would I would agree. Probably it's a uh, supranal valve, so we are mainly looking at durability in such a young patient. So supranal valve, this valve also has less pacemaker rate, so we are also concerned regarding the pacemaker in such young patients. So that also goes in favor. It has large cells, and of course uh, this would give us ability to hook the coronaries later on uh, much better than other. Uh, self-expanding systems which have slightly smaller uh, cells I would say and of course you have uh, commissure on the top there is something which is com on the top of the commissures you could see a uh, diamond sort of structure which is radiologically visible so you can also try for commissure alignment keeping one of them on the right hand side and overlapping two of the tentacles on the right hand side so you can probably achieve probably reasonable commercial alignment also. So our main concerns regarding the patient process mismatch, regarding good hemodynamics, low pacemaker rates, coronary access, most of them are answered with this. Yeah. So if there's no further comments, let's, let's see the case and we can discuss afterwards. So then we can go for crossing the valve. Yeah. yeah just... This patient has a VVI pacemaker already. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, we, can, we can discuss that afterwards uh, because sure. a pacemaker is not always a pacemaker. Uh, it's depending on whether you're using it or not. Yeah. Okay, maybe again. So we're in okay, the one cusp more. overlap view. Yeah, we are. So we're crossing here in the cusp overlap view. Uh, so we have the pixel again in the non coronary cusp. So often we just need to search immediately on the right side or the patient's left side of that pigtail catheter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here you are. And okay, then we have an exchange wire already there. <coughs> just crossing here with the AL1 catheter. We can take that wire out, uh, Tanya, and then going in with an exchange wire and exchange for a pigtail catheter. Yeah, we'll do it later. Yeah, okay, this falls nicely there, yeah. Okay. All right, I have the wire, yeah, that's good. I'll clean the wire. Are you clean it? Okay, that's good. Bring in a pigtail. So we, as a routine, introduce a pigtail catheter boat to have good hemodynamic assessment um, before and after valve deployment as part of the PVL assessment, but also to have a more safe uh, introduction of the stiff wire in a second here. Yeah, yeah that's nice. Hemodynamics.
So oh, let's good. see, we can do some hemodynamic recording. We, we've, we've for sure, the patient have a, a very high gradient as expected from the mm -hmm. echocardiography. It's around 80 millimeter mercury, but maybe of more interest in the PVL assessment, we're going to record the diastolic pressure in the aorta, which is 41, and uh, in diastolic pressure in the LV, which is 13. So we're going to record these two numbers. So ready for the stephoides? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay, maybe make one out. Okay, give us the take over here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's nice, yeah. That's good. Yeah, I have the wire. Yeah. That's the 18. Oh, we gave even a bit more than uh, normal, so it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are on the safe side. This is an 18 millimeter balloon. Yep. Okay. So we're just um, we're going to do LV pacing as most sites are doing. Just explain um, uh, how we we're doing it. Yeah. So this is that Venus uh, sheet of five French sheet, and we just introduced the small short wire that comes in the kit of the sheet mm -hmm. that's just introduced. So it has a nice intravascular uh, co contact. Mm -hmm. And there is one of the crocodiles on, and then of course the other end of the crocodile is on the on the stiff wire, the yeah. safari wire. Yeah. So, so we have one in the, in the venous sheet instead of having it on the needle? Yeah, correct. And that should give uh, better capture and also prevent that we do, uh, uh, yeah, muscle, that we have that muscle contraction mm -hmm. with the patient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So should we pace 180, Baba, if whenever you're pacing on? Yes, pressure is down, balloon goes up. Okay, no, it's not uh, come on, come on. Yeah, stop pacing. Stop pacing. Yeah. Seem to have free space, Stella. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was based on the minor axis yeah. of the aortic analysis, of course, mm -hmm. so it's... we prefer to stay a little bit mm. more conservative there. Mm. Yeah. Next. Yeah, then we're gonna have to take the sheet out. Mm. Maybe just a dilator if you have. Check the oh, Okay. All right. Good. Then we take it out. Is there a fluoro? Yeah, fluoro life. Bring this one out and all it will compress. I compress and I grab the wire. And again this valve have an integrated sheet so we don't need the external sheet here just have to make sure we don't have over sheet that's the one yeah, check we have fine yeah that looks yeah. good yeah and i'll give it to you and i can do a little bit rotation here as you try to go in with the yeah go super nice in yeah yeah, yeah. And go, it slides super nice in yeah. also. Yeah. All right, that's very good. Okay. And we can we maybe can connect maybe to pressure, pressure again. again huh? No. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So let's see. Should we go to some yeah. LAO maybe to open up the arch a little bit? And we can see how it travels yeah. over the arch. Uh, so you give a little bit railing here against us as we yeah. come over. Really? And you will see it's a very flexible system. I often it'll take that corner quite easy. Yeah, yeah it sounds so easy. Even making a kink on, on the capsule itself, like mm -hmm. this. So it's really, really? It's yeah. very, very forgiven if, if these kind of anatomies. Yeah, they go smooth. Yeah. And we have some horizontality, you remember yeah. from the CT. So um, I'll go to the cusp overlap now. Yeah. There was some kind of uh, like RO234, yeah, like that. Okay, that's, here we are. Maybe go a little bit deeper, see where we yeah. take to take the parallax Somebody out. Somebody holds the wire. Yeah, I got the wire. Let's see now, there's no parallax in the system. No, not much. So that's good. So you see there's a nose cone at the end, um, followed by that radio pack ring at the end of the capsule. First part of the capsule is empty. You have the bottom of the stent frame, and then you have three markers. Mm -hmm. And those markers should sit just above uh, the annulus at the end if you have, want to have a good posi position here. Yep. Injector is enabled. So 
So when if you are if you are happy, Ole, I will yep. start to to rotate here on the blue knob. I'll just go counterclockwise. Yeah. Yeah, there. Okay. And we can see here, and we will won't do an injection yet. No. Maybe come a little bit too low. We can pull a little bit up. We are ready to base if needed. Let's yeah, all right. So see now the ring is leaving the nose cone. It's coming up to the bottom of the inflow part of the capsule. I can go up to the first intersection and then I think back. we are going to do an injection yeah, like when we are forward. here to confirm also where we have the pigtail. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Pigtail is in a good position. Yeah. Uh, and I think you are... We can go one you, millimeter up. Yeah, but I think you are not too bad. Okay. No. And, and now we're going to pace, Barbara, we can pace 140. Yeah. Um, max output, yes. I think it's quite that's, stable. There's no capture. Okay, no, okay, now, yeah. now it's so, so it just goes slowly here. Position is good, I think. Like the marker is just on top of the analyst. Bring it maybe just one millimeter back. Well, let's just leave them. We, we'll just go here. Come up for 120 pacing. I come little Huna. I've been trying to pull gently yeah. back during the deployment. Uh, come out, Payson. Stop it. Go to an LAO. Well, that looks quite nice. So let's see here where we are. Uh, Ready for injection? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I can pull even a bit back, centralized, yeah, and then I think that. it will yeah. be good. Yeah, try to pull a bit back. I'm quite happy with this. Yeah, like this. So nope. when you pull in the system here, it's, uh, it's going to get high yeah. on the non-coronary side. I've pulled quite a bit back on it already. Take my pigtail back and we're just going to do the release here. Slowly then. Yeah. Pull the wire back here. Yeah. Yeah, and we can continue deploying. Yeah, that's good. So I'm going a hard stop, so we have to see all three tentacles are released. Uh, we have that otherwise mechanism. we can just take that small blue knob up here, and then we have uh, an active relief mechanism which is going to bring those taps into the delivery system to make sure it's mm -hmm. fully released here. Yeah. So I am at hard stop, so maybe we should just go with your... I'll go over to the NRA. Yeah. And Check confirm. In. Um, We're not do we still have sure one? About so we can one. do a little bit rotation, gentle rotation yeah, we'll do a here. Gentle rotation. So mm -hmm. no. Okay, and we went to full end it there. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. One, yeah, two, it's off. It, yeah. Up, up, so up I'll, for just, sure off. I'll just DMAC here. We can yeah. take the wire off. Sheet here. is uh, ready. And, and uh, uh, I'll push the wire. Oh, maybe we lost the wire position. Yeah. Wait, I can go forward again yeah. if you keep it there. I can move forward. Okay. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. So let's go to the descending auto. And we're going to close yep. the system, just doing the opposite. We're just going clockwise here on on the blue knob and make sure that the nose cone is coming down to us and not the system going up to, the capsule is going up to the nose cone. So to try to minimize the risk of vascular complication during this phase. Sheet is ready. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and now it's close. That's the nose cone is in. Yeah, that's good. We can come out. Yeah, okay, that's nice. Yeah. Let's get the sheet in then. And then we go back and do some hemodynamic assessments mm -hmm. in, a, in a second here. Goes easier. Yeah, it goes easier. Okay. So we can start looking at the hemodynamic assessment here. Uh, I'll just do 
a recording. Uh, we had 41 before as diastolic pressure in the aorta. It's mm -hmm. 37, very close. We still have 30, 13 as the, the end diastolic pressure in the LV. So that cool. looks promising. Yep. So let's do an, uh, an, um, an injection, Ole. Yeah. It looks very nice to me. There's not uh, much, no PVL uh, at all. I mean, you have exactly the position you want. You have those yeah, yeah. radio pack dots mm. just above the aortic annulus, yeah. I think. That's Good. really nice. No greater, no PVL. Uh, exactly, because this is a super small anatomy, yeah. so it's extremely important. Yeah. We have no gradient. That's yeah. that's one. Uh, there's literally zero invasively. Yeah. We have this extremely flat, low left ventricular and diastolic pressure that already mm. gives some signal that there's probably no leak. So I think it's a very nice outcome. Very nice, yeah. So, Manik, any comments to to this procedure uh, from your side? I mean, you, you have seen quite a few of these procedures and also see other platforms. So maybe you can just give some comparison to what else on the market. I mean, it's a very flexible delivery system. Uh, the nose cone also is very flexible, so introduction is very nice. The... The inline sheath is uh, very smooth and it is uh, at par with uh, all the competitors. Of course, the delivery system is also very flexible and it can take kinks, which uh, which are there in the descending thoracic aorta as well as in the aortic arc, which is also important for the subcontinent because we have a lot of bicuspids in which you have quite a tortuous uh, aorta and aortopathy. So that you, you can probably see in the view when we're descending the aortic arc, the valve per se could be easily bended. So that, that is something which is very good. And of course, you have markers at the lower uh, position. So you can exactly see where you want to deploy, especially when you are doing in the RL cuspo levy because the parallax is gone. You see the dots and you can predict, deploy it very predictably. You can argue that probably why a depth of five, but we know that this is a cylindrical valve. It gives less stress at the level of analysts. It's a large cell thing. There is less metal lower down. And uh, the radial strength is is uh, is not as it's optimal. I would say it's not extra large. So so the amount of stretch is less. So probably in this patient, I think had right bundle branch block earlier, and later on also probably um, this is a lead which is screwing lead from the from the top just to be prophylactic up front. So I think this patient might also get away without pacemaker. So I think all in all, it suits uh, it suits a lot for the case. So so you you are most how should I say um, uh, treating patients in India, and, and as you said, it's been using in a lot of patients with bicuspid aortic valve with with good outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Alfonso, you're probably the person in Europe who have most experience with this platform. So can you give your European perspective on this valve compared to other valves on the market? Well, this is a very interesting new transcatheter art valve because as some peculiar features we have already highlighted, uh, the best, in my opinion, it is the highly uh, flexibility of the delivery system. And the second one is related to the radial uh, strength, which is not high but not low. So it means that the trauma uh, at the level of the membranous septum, it is relatively uh, low and it translates in a relatively low uh, permanent pacemaker uh, implantation uh, rates. Um, well, it is very difficult at the moment to um, consider and to uh, think about the best spot for each transcatheter valve because we have a huge amount of new devices at the moment. Some are much more known, some other a bit less. So in talking and thinking about either, uh, in my uh, idea, the best spots are horizontal aorta, small annuli and even valve in valve procedures, particularly with some um, valves with uh, very high uh, stent frames where the uh, valve crossing could be not very easy with some other self-expanding devices without a deflectable delivery system. Uh, as you are showing us, there are some clinical data about... Yeah, you can the just, uh, just tell what the clinical data are, if not everyone can read the numbers. Uh, yeah. so this is from the from the C mark study in Europe and also from the Indian approval study. So so just take us through it. 
Well, there are, um, as you were saying, two uh, studies. One performed in India with a relatively small uh, number of patients, but the results were very promising in terms of uh, hemodynamics and clinical uh, outcome, as well as the uh, European uh, study where 157 patients were enrolled. The uh, data are, have been published in uh, JACC uh, intervention. And the results, as you can see, are very, very interesting because more than moderate uh, paravalvular leak at 30 days was uh, 0%, while new permanent pacemaker implantation uh, 30 days around 7.5%, but most important are the hemodynamic per, uh, data coming from this uh, study. In particular, mean aortic valve gradient was 6.7 millimeter of mercury, while mean effective orifice area 2.3 centimeter square. So it means that this valve, it is really a good option in patient with small annuli, as we were saying before. Yeah. Dave, we're coming to the end of the session. Would you just wrap up what we discussed? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to consider, particularly in younger patients, lifetime considerations, which is optimal hemodynamics, reaccess to the coronary arteries, and avoidance wherever possible of conduction disease. And I think you've seen with this valve, we've been able to achieve this uh, in this case, and the results also belie that as well. Mm. So thank you for attending this session. Thank you for SMT for sponsoring this session. Thank you for the panel here. Enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of Europe PCR 2023. Thank you. Thank you.